So I thought we'd uh, start out just a couple quick uh, things here. I, we were talking about simplicity a number of times, and I think one of the quotes that Mark had pulled there uh, was my grandpa. This one, there's a book, Profound Simplicity, that has nothing to do with health, but this is exactly what this is, Profound Simplicity. It's profound that it holds the truth and all of its splendor within itself, and still it's so simple but unfortunately, most people are unimpressed by the truth. And I want to bring that memory, that thought, back to you every day. Because when you wake up in the morning, the whole idea, the concept here, is that the simplicity of your life should be just that simple, gorgeous, elegant, but simple. Not over complicated, not over difficult. You don't have to go deep into places that are over complex. Get back to the simplicity, and that's what we're going to talk about with pragmatism a bit. So you recall the tenets of natural hygiene, as we talked about, and as we spoke of yesterday, is that these are the tenets of living a science-based healthy lifestyle, not some just philosophical perspective, but actually where all the science is now pointing us, which is so exciting. We were talking a little bit about history and such, and I was walking out with my meal, here's my meal for breakfast, I was thinking, wow, how gorgeous this was, but also how little truth changes when I went back and was just looking at some photos, here's my mother preparing food in the kitchen for breakfast at Esther's Ranch, and here she is with a plate of food delivering it to a patient. And I just couldn't stop and go, oh wow, look, it's the same, here we are 50 some whatever years later. And here was a fun little photo of my grandfather right there at uh, one of the big NHA conferences decades and decades ago. It's a lot of fun to kind of continue to see this organization blooming and growing, and with all of you, sharing this beautiful and exciting message. If you weren't familiar with it, here was the old branch. Always fun to see old photos and stuff. If you, if you like some of those, we have all the old brochures on our website, Esther Health. Uh, fun to just look at some of the old history if you like that sort of thing. Of course, that's me on my grandfather's shoulders. Certainly where I think I'll always be when it comes to this. You know, and the beauty is though, you also have people on your shoulders and your connection. That whole circles of influence piece. So when you leave here, the goal is to share the message, right? with those who are closest to you in a way that changes and transforms their life, just like mine was by my grandfather and so many others. So today we're going to talk about some pitfalls, because we've learned a little bit of the science the last day and a half, and the rest of today and tomorrow you're going to learn more of the science and the clinical application. But I also want to make sure that you're aware of the pitfalls. You know, it's not a commonly used word, pitfall. I had to stop and think of what it really was. So really, right, it's that thing, that hole in the ground with coverage over it for an animal that's unsuspecting to fall into. So when you leave and you walk out and you adopt these healthier lifestyles, these healthier choices, you need to be prepared for what the pitfalls are. So you can see the signs of them perhaps creeping up in your conversations or in your psyche. So immediately you can walk around the pitfall or be sure that you fill the pitfall with the appropriate organic produce. <laughs> so you walk over the top. But this is important where you build the bridge across the pitfall. But think about that in your own life, because you should, by this point in your life, know yourself pretty well. And if you know yourself well, then you can identify those pitfalls. If you don't know yourself well, we've got a whole other problem. That's a different story. So, a hidden or unsuspected danger or difficulty. Let's talk about some of them. Now, these are my personal opinions, of course, which you're stuck listening to for a couple of minutes. But think about your own pitfalls that you may think of as well. The first one that I've seen decade in and decade out in my grandfather's ranch and beyond is extremism. Now, it's funny because some people might say that what we're advocating today is extremists. However, the beauty is that the science no longer says what we are advocating is extremism. And so you can grab that great book like, you know, uh, McGregor's book, How Not to Die, and pull out the last 200 pages of scientific articles and share with people. And show that the overwhelming burden of evidence is in the support of what we are sharing day in and day out. All the books that you can get outside that are so fantastic, the YouTube videos with lots of science, right, on and on. So the science says that this plant-based approach, exercise is medicine, mind-body approaches are drenched in good scientific validation. But there are other extremisms, whether it be I'm going to be a fruititarian 100% of the time, or I need blank at every meal or else blank, or let's say that I have no stored resources on my body, yet I still think that I need to fast again and again. 
And, or when I say I can, the extreme other side, I can run off any unhealthy food I eat. Or if I eat veggies, I can stay in the sun, 10 hours a day without sunscreen or protection like we spoke of. But people get sometimes extremist ideas in their brain. Choose the one that you may have heard or seen or experienced yourself. And be aware of that extremist perspective. And make sure that is not one that you are going in that direction. Whether it be the extreme of saying, I only need nutrition, I don't need exercise, right? Or the like. So be aware of those extremes. The next one is pseudo-spiritualism. I remember this so well. I walked into the kitchen of the ranch one day, and a woman, every time she got her meal, would hold her meal up, they'd have her hold up, and she'd take a crystal. And if it spun to the right, she could have the food that day. If it spun to the left, she could not have it. Now I watched her every day do that, and I noticed it always seemed to spin to the right when it was more of like cheese day with protein, <laughs> or it was a lot of sugary sweet food. I'd watch her hand, there's a little slight thing, right? But this was her pseudo-spiritualism about this. And again, if you choose, as I said yesterday, to go with things that have no validation in science, but are also extremely low risk, so be it. That's your decision. But we are not here to share or to promote or encourage pseudo-spiritualism. We are here to encourage, promote, validate, and encourage science-based principles that are the best science in existence today. So be aware of some of these things. They're beautiful, like this beautiful thing about the cup of water that everybody holds their hands around and say positive things to it and it changes the vibration. That's fine, that's a beautiful little time together and holding hands, there may be something to it. But there is no science at this point that says that that water will be any better for you than distilled water at True North. It was made in a stainless steel container. So just be careful as you go down the route. And why is this important to me? Well, number one, as a scientist, this matters. And number two, it dilutes the message. Our message at this point is so incontrovertible when it comes to plant-based nutrition reducing the risk of all common cardiometabolic diseases. Done in the story. If you, as I love, uh, Willie, Kim Williams, former president of the American College of Cardiology, said there are vegan cardiologists and there are those who have not read the literature. <laughs> and that's the truth. And so what we really need to be saying is the science is so clear. And guess what, guys? In addition, I have my own personal opinions about love water. That's fine. But do not go out and share this message of great potential and dilute it out with some weirdness. Sorry. Okay? <laughs> That's me speaking again as the Harvard scientist, whatever, fine. But just let's make sure we are separating the two out. Because for too long, this message has been held down by connotations of negativity and doubt and pseudo-spirituals, right? So who, when you use the word vegan, what do most people think of, right? A peace snake who's living in the woods somewhere and has pet animals or something, right? And that's okay. But that's not where the, that's not... And that is not embracing the fullness of the scientific message that is now validating what we're trying to do. Right? Okay? So we want everybody. Are you with me on this? Yeah. yeah? Okay, that's where we are with this, okay? So the next pitfall is isolation. A lot of people begin to make decisions about their healthy living and they feel like they have to live by themselves. None of their friends, they cut themselves off from all these different aspects of life. And they feel isolated, feel alone. And that in and of itself is a reason not to continue on the journey of health. So you need to avoid that. If you say, let's use the alcoholic for the example. The alcoholic knows when he hangs out with Vinny and John, sorry if Vinny and John are in here, Vinny and John, right, that he's going to drink. So does he have to get away from Vinny and John if he wants to break his addictive patterns? Yes, for that period of time. But you know what he needs to do? He needs to make friends with Charles and Julia. So now he's got the other friends that he can spend time with. So this is so inherently important that as you're making better health decisions, you are broadening your circle of friends and people. This was a mistake that was made in my family because the world was, quote, against us at the time, right? Was against you. There was this conflict. So it was, well, we're going to do all this stuff over here and teach the message and spread the and we'll be involved in society, but at the same time still be on the fringe. What I've decided for my life is it's so important for me to engage with more people with more involvement, people I have nothing in common with. Why? So I can share the message. Not in an aggressive, negative way, but in a way they go, wow, there's something about that guy. And he's always bringing all those colorful salads with him everywhere. And all those fun fruits I've never heard of before. And I'm trying them. And that gets them in. So do not isolate yourselves, but rather expand your community. 
spread out and find new people and different people, as well as, of course, now that we have the internet with all these wonderful groups of people and meetups and all the rest, opportunities to be out there. Do not be separate. Now, in addition, this goes to the next pitfall, which is misidentifying the final goal. Our goal of this whole thing here is not for you to just live a healthy life. It's for you to live a healthy life so you can go out and do whatever it is, right? You care for a family, build a business, transform your community, explore the world. So the final goal is not that you sit down and eat a big bowl of plants and exercise and do some mindfulness. That is the foundation of a vital life. Do you know what I'm saying? Because some people get so absorbed in the message and the singularity of the changes they are required or called to make, they lose out on who they really are and what their passions are. So if you're a photographer, right? If you're a grandparent, if you're a business owner, you're eating healthfully in a health-promoting way so you can be amazing at that. That's the goal, right? So really make sure you're remembering that in the midst of this. So there will be times where perhaps you will not eat the most health-promoting food, and you will not get as much, as much exercise as you perhaps would like to or should, and so you can turn right on, and you keep going with your journey. You know, I say to my patients the following, all too often we have a mentality, we say, I fell off the wagon. I would just like to say, none of us right now are on a moving vehicle <laughs> of any kind. And with your health, you are never on a wagon. So we need why. Why is that? Because that concept, that imagery, conjures up the idea that you fell off the wagon, the wagon kept going, and you're yelling, wait, wait, wait. And there's, how do you ever get back on it? How do you get back on the wagon, right? It has to stop you, you have to get up onto it, or you have to get a faster moving vehicle, get up around, see, I've thought about this. <laughs> but instead, you're on a journey, right? You're on a journey called life, and you're walking through a beautiful woods, let's say, but let's say they're brambles and they catch on your leg. What do you do? Well, obviously, you throw yourself headlong into the brambles, start screaming like crazy and say, I'm such a failure. My brambles are all over me. Or if you're walking through the mud, you step in the middle of the mud, right? What do you do? You throw yourself head first in the mud and you start flapping, right? No. The moment the brambles get on you, you wipe them off your leg, you keep walking. You step in some mud, what's the first thing you do? You keep walking and it dries and falls off your boots, correct? So it's very important that you do not see yourself on a moving vehicle as this part of your lifestyle. Because so many people go, well, I tried and I fell off. I fell trying and I fell off. You're not on anything to fall off of. <laughs> You're walking on a journey. There are ups and downs and hills and valleys. And just keep walking. But you see, in our world, if I can convince you that you're on a moving vehicle, I can convince you you're also a failure. Right? So if you're walking along a journey, there's no failure. It's just keep walking and see how it goes. So stop with the negative self okay? about the, oh my gosh. Also, I just like to, a quick aside, stop talking about morality with your food. Why? Because as soon as you say, oh, that oh, looks so good, I want it, I want it. But I know I shouldn't have it. I want it, but I shouldn't have it. It's almost like a little teenage boy with pornography. It's ridiculous. Okay? So the idea here for you is that you say, these foods are health-promoting, this behavior is health-promoting, and these foods and these behaviors are not health-promoting. If you steal away all morality, all of a sudden, there's not that temptation. There's not that desire. You walk up and you look at this rich chocolate cake, and you go, wow, that is a really rich chocolate cake. It has no value to me whatsoever. In fact, it will undermine my health. Why would I want that? Beautifully created, very nice, smells great. Thanks for showing it to me. We'll move on. Instead of saying in your head, oh my gosh, I really want it, I shouldn't have it, this whole dialogue, all this nonsense, really, that you're creating here. That isn't even reality. Because your biggest number one goal should be, I want to be healthy. And where does health come from? Healthy living. So as a result, the decisions you make should reinforce the final end goal, which is to be healthy so you can then live the best life. The next pitfall is that of perfectionism. Let's just face it, you and I will never be perfect. Healthy food and exercise will never make you immortal. Healthy food and exercise will not make you 100% injury or disease resistant. However, they will radically reduce your risk of common diseases and enhance your quality of life and reduce your likelihood of disability. 
That is what the science says, so let's just cut it there. What has frustrated me as I've been through the last 40 years of being part of this whole movement of healthy food, nutrition, exercise, and plant-based nutrition is that one, one of our leaders, let's say, or even one of the followers, whatever, gets unwell, and we immediately points fingers. See, I told you. I told you this wouldn't work. I told you what would happen here. So when we get an 80 or 90 year old person, for example, who begins to get a little bit of cognitive decline, everybody goes, ah, not enough omega-3 fats, I told you. <laughs> even though they've had never a day of sickness or whatever in their life, right? So this is very important. This is not a philosophical, theological promise of perfection, you will be in heaven. This is a promise that your risk of all the common diseases radically is reduced, okay? But we are not perfect, and that's good to you. We're not seeking perfection. We're seeking vitality. We're seeking health. Two very different things. So make sure you're telling yourself that, because a lot of people say to me, I failed. What are you talking about? You didn't fail. I didn't make some unhealthy food. Why are you even using that language? There's nothing you fail at. You ate some unhealthy food. Stop. Right? Now go eat some healthy food. Duh. Right? So this is, this, it's just the mind, because remember, your mind is the most powerful tool that you have. So it's fascinating to me, right? So when I grew up as a kid, we were not allowed pizzas and uh, snacks and Snickers and all this sort of garbage, right? Because we were Essers. And we had to live this certain way. Unacceptable, right? I still remember this one time sneaking to my father's club and I got a Snickers. We had a big tennis club across from the branch. I got a little Snickers and I went and I hid in the bathroom and I started to go down and I was like, oh my gosh, and I felt so guilty and so horrible. And then, like, they caught me and I got in a lot of trouble. And it was one of those crazy moments, right, where it was like, oh my goodness. And there was that push and pull. And when I was told, you're not allowed these foods, so I was like, oh, I can't have them. I really want them, right? Why can I sneak a piece of pizza? Things like that. And I got into medical school and I realized, wait a second, hold on. Number one, do you want to share this message or not to people? Number two, do you want to be healthy or not? And that was the big one that started hitting me. And I said, look, do you want to be healthy or not? Where does health come from? You're intelligent. Health comes from these behaviors. So I said, you're right. Why would I even want those things? And there's an ability, remember something called neural plasticity? You guys remember that? The idea you can change the way your nervous system is wired over time. So every time you think the thought that says, oh, I'm such a failure, you just went down that wiring pathway. But every time you just go, I'm a healthy person who cares about health. Not perfect, but I'm going to eat the best I can. You just lay on that pathway. And so when you go and you talk about foods, be careful, like we said, is it good food or bad food? No. It's either health promoting or not health promoting. And when I began to do that in my own brain, it was fascinating. Now I can walk up to the richest food, the most amazing pizza, whatever it might be, and I have zero interest whatsoever even in tasting it. I can appreciate the culinary expertise that I'm making it. I can look at the colors, I can smell it, and say, oh, oh that looks amazing. But I look at it and go, I don't want that. Why? Because it's not going to help me be healthy, which is that goal. So you can rewire your brain, but it takes awareness of your thoughts first. But that's extremely important that you're aware of that. You get rid of pursuing perfection, and rather pursue health. Very different things. The next pitfall is moderation, right? Moderation. People say it all the time to me. Well, if I just eat a little bit, if I'm just moderate in what I do. They say things like, a little bad stuff won't hurt me. So this comes back to first to the real question. What is your number one goal? Is it to be healthy? If it's to be healthy, where does the science say health comes from? If your goal is to be healthy, and we know where health comes from, why would you take even a small amount of things that are unhealthy into your system? Why? You're saying that that taste of that food, or whatever it might be, is more important than your number one goal. I have a gorgeous car, let's say. I don't want to drive a Honda. It's had a beat up, and that's okay. Let's say I've got a gorgeous high-test car. It takes nothing but high-test fuel. Would I ever go up to the pump and say, well, I can just put a few drops of diesel in. It's not a big deal. No, why would you do it? Why? Is there any reason to do it? Well, it was cheaper. Well, it was more convenient. Oh, we've heard this for food, haven't we? Right? But there's no reason to do that. You know the car runs best off of the high test fuel. So wouldn't you want to put the best in that car? Why wouldn't we do that for our own bodies? So we need to be having those conversations again and again, right? So there are days I go to a party at a friend's house, there is nothing there that is health promoting. That's fine, I grab a glass of cold water and I go and I, we have fun. 
right? I have a great time, and I don't eat anything, and that's okay. Or I know there's going to be nothing health promoting, and I say, hey, I'd love to bring a new salad I'm experimenting with. Can I do that? So I eat tons of salad and some water. Right? Now, that, I grant you, which is fun now, most of our friends were all some conventional, some plant based, etc. Whenever we go, now they always have stuff that's plant based, right? Because they know and they've been to our house, etc. So we change their openness, right? But so remember, again, we're not seeking perfection. Moderation, you just have to be careful with that. Right? You could say moderate amounts of healthy behaviors are healthy for you, but not true moderation. Why? Cyanide and moderation is not very good. You know? <laughs> I mean, just a few drops here and there. Why? Why are we doing that? So you have to be able to say in your own brain, is this food that I'm about to eat, is this lack of exercise that I'm getting, is this emotional negativity that I'm feeding, do I have a reason for this that's bigger than my number one goal, which is to be healthy? That's all it comes down to, folks, really, isn't it? We are reprioritizing our life every day and every moment. And if you are chronically prioritizing healthy behaviors, they suddenly become your habits. They suddenly become part of who you are. You know, I, I would hope, I would hope, that no one in this room would ever think at all, even think about it, of going home and cutting up a loved one into small pieces and stuffing them back. Right? Because that is so beyond the pale. There's a line and you just go, I would never even think of that, right? So in the same way, we know we can change our behaviors through our thoughts. So if you begin to draw a line that just says, I just don't do that, it just becomes part of who you are. So when there is that big barbecue on the, you know, whatever, at somebody's house, I walk up and I just talk to the friend who's making the barbecue. I have zero interest in this dead animal that's rotting on the table. <laughs> right? Zero interest. Same as I walk into a, you know, a nice, uh, you know, let's say a donut shop, a high-end artisanal right, dessert shop, and I might want a little fruit sorbet or a glass of cold water. I look at all these beautiful things, I go, wow, you guys are really artists. This is some beautiful stuff. But I have zero interest. Why? Because I've drawn that line so clearly at this point in my brain that it's like with cutting people off. I just don't even think about it. It's an interesting concept when you really get into it. You know what I mean? When you think about that line in your brain, because some of us have our foot on either side of the line. And we're kind of like, well, I'm here, no, I'm not, I'm here, I'm that. It's just like, just make a decision. Come over here and just walk along and then live your way. It's a beautiful thing, though. What it's done for me is set me free. I no longer sit there waxing and thinking about and Oh, no, that, that, oh, you know, that. No. It's just like, that's not healthy. Why would I want that? Done. It does take time. So you can be patient with yourself. It's okay. You've got to start recognizing your thoughts and how powerful they are and how you talk about some of this stuff. The next pitfall is losing hope in the face of adversity, right? This is important. So just because someone who lived a healthy life gets a disease or dies does not mean the lifestyle is bogus. This is inherently important because other people will go, well, George Burns lived until he was, right? And he smoked and he drank and he ate whatever the heck he wanted. So there are genetic, random people that appear to be able to abuse the heck out of their bodies and still do pretty well. But none of us know our genes and our genetics, right? Maybe George Burns would look at 125 with no problems and eat a healthy diet and exercise well, right? So it's very important we don't get sucked into the, that. Because now, at this point, we have so much science. We know what science is. So this is not just about personal opinion or anecdotal stories. That's what's so important here. Right? So it's not anymore that we're following a cult of one guy who says you'll have immortality and then a few guys all have cult separates, okay? And this is science, hard and clear. So, yes, bad things can still happen to good people as we heard earlier. But the evidence for overall interventions on health is incontrovertible. The next one is very similar, judging others who get sick or injured. This is very important because you may have a circle of people that you develop relationships with and they may be making very good health decisions. And one day one of them gets sick. And there's nothing like being sick and then being rejected by your friends. Because they think, oh, look at you. See, I told you. You shouldn't have done that. Uh, pointing fingers. This is a pitfall. It destroys people. It destroys relationships. And there's no value to that when we're trying to encourage, empower, motivate, and help those around us. So be aware that you, through your snide comments, commentary, pointing your fingers, whatever it might be, you're not falling into that trap. Because it truly is one that I've seen again and again. I'd like to now transition 
We're going to transition to pragmatism. So as you know, pragmatism is more of a philosophical perspective with regards to the success and the practical application of knowledge and beliefs. So really what we're going to talk about is more of a pragmatic approach, dealing with things sensibly and realistically in a way that's based on practical rather than theoretical considerations. I'd like you, if you're taking notes, to take notes of a couple of these because I think they're of value. So let's start simply. The number one thing that you need to do before and when you leave this wonderful program in the next couple of days is to identify your personal health goals. This is essentially important. And it's important because many of us go through life almost expecting that our health just falls out of the sky on us. It's fascinating, you know, you would never build a house and just call up Home Depot and say, just throw me a little lumber, I don't know, some nails, let's see how this goes. No, you have the architect, you have the bloopers, you have the contractor, you have the electrician, you have everybody, right? How many of you, by a quick show of hands, have a written, documented, detailed health plan? A personal health plan for your life. So great, so we got like two people. So that's great. <laughs> and that's a good beginning, we'll stay positive. But really, why don't you? Why don't you? Is it because you don't really believe what you do has an effect on your health? Is it because you're lazy and it's too much work? Is it because you're scared that if you put it down on paper, you have to do it? What is it? But if you and I are walking through life right now without a health plan, we are like the person trying to build a house with no knowledge of anything and just throwing stuff up. Without a clear step-by-step -step progression. So you need to go home and you need to write out what are my health goals, right? Is it preventing disease? Is it reversing disease? Is it reducing my medicines? Is it longevity? Is it improving for its function? Or is it for looks and aesthetics? Then, once you establish what that goal is, you need to write out four or five things that you are going to do to achieve the goal. My athletes right now, I take care of the Division I University of North Florida, I'm the doctor for all the athletes. I guarantee you, every single one of them, their coaches and the athletes have a plan for how they're going to perform at their best during this upcoming school year. The strength training coach, the psychologist we have, the nutritionist we're on board, right? The, all this on, on, on. Our health is in our hands. Make sure you recognize how powerful that is. So think in your head, what are my goals for this coming year? Because each year may change, right? Every year may be different. You can modify it accordingly. But please, this is inherently important to help you be successful long term. The next one is the following. Once you've identified your personal health goals, then you need to review the science, okay? You need to review the science. Because you may say, well, actually, my health goal for this coming year is I want to get better hair growth on the top of my head. I'm not looking for heart disease reversal and all that. That's the thing that you're focused on right now. Well, if that's the case, maybe you could go and talk about platelet-rich plasma injections on the top of your head or other random things that are low risk that may increase the likelihood of hair growth or whatever it might be. But you need to know what your goals are for you. As Dr. Lynn earlier said, all too often the physician-patient relationship is based on the physician saying what they want for the patient. Our entire goal with the NHA, etc., is to educate and empower you, and you and you and you and you, to be able to take control of your own health, which requires that you sit down, identify the goals, and then go through the scientific literature. We're here to share the science. We're here to share with you the tools. But first, we need to know the goals. The next one is the following. Identify your willingness to change your life so that what you do helps you to achieve what you say you want. Got that? Now that was an interesting one for me because again, I would start saying, well, I really want that pizza or I really want the glass of beer or I really want that Snickers bar. But did I really? Did I really want those things? Or what was the bigger thing I really wanted? So what do you really want? And then, what is your willingness to change? Because that's where really the rubber hits the road. So where you're making the decision of saying, I know I want this, but it's not yet a big enough read. I'm not there yet. So here's what you should do. You draw a line down the center of your page. On one side, you said, write my reasons to change. And on the other side, you write my reasons not to change. And as soon as you have more reasons to change than reasons not to change, you're ready 
to begin to make some transition. You know, I used to think it was all just about knowledge. If it was all just about knowledge, of course, then everybody who's ever you know, watched any of these movies or seen any of these books or come to any age would be radically healthy the rest of their life. But when you really look at behavior modification, the pyramid looks more like this. And the only part that's benefits and information is that little tiny red right there. Everything else that moves people to behavior change are all the other blocks. That's important. For some people, like I have a friend of mine, he's a psychologist, he's amazing. This guy walks forwards over knives, saw you in you alive, read a couple books, and boom, that was it for him. Entire life changed, not one more time did he ever eat any salt, oil, sugar, meat, dairy, blah, blah, blah. Got so incredibly healthy, and he still is. Right? That's not most people, right? Most people, it's all the other stuff, all the other pieces of the puzzle. So make sure you're lining yourself up for success by looking at something like this and saying, which part of this pyramid is the weakest for me? Which one do I need to focus on? But again, you're not ready to focus on that until you know what your goals are first, right? What really matters to you, and then walk through the rest of the pages. Dr. Lynn mentioned this earlier. Here are your stages of change, right? Right there, that pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance. So for different parts of our lives, we're in different places. So let's say a guy who exercises a lot, he's already the action phase of exercise. But let's say all he does is eat McDonald's, he's not interested in changing his diet, he's still in pre-contemplation. So in different aspects of your life, you're probably in different places. But wow, what amazing it would be if you sat down with a little piece of paper and wrote out those six tenets of natural hygiene or healthy living and said, where I, am I with each of these? Have I achieved my goals in nutrition, in exercise, in mind, body, in sleep, in some sunlight sport, in emotional poise, so on and so forth? And then you can target each of those areas for the next 12 months, the ones that you need to focus on. Just like for me, for example, the nutrition piece, whatever, hands down, easy peasy. The rest of it, I need more work on. Where am I getting my exercise when I'm in such a busy state? How are my sleep habits? How are my emotions, etc. right? So those are areas that I can improve on. So each of us has those. So think about where you are in your stages of change. And then develop that plan. But you cannot just say, well, I'm going to start walking. No. You have to say, I'm going to start a walking program Thursday mornings at 7 a.m. I'm going to walk two blocks and come home. That's what's called a smart walk. It's specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. And I'm going to start next week. I would encourage all of you so strongly that tonight or tomorrow, you sit down with your handouts, you sit down with your notebooks, and you actually take the time to write a plan. Because the fires are burning. You're excited right now. You're inspired, I hope. And all of the rest. But this can die out as you leave this place, right? So maybe you need to go to some exciting places and do a plant-based retreat. You've heard about some of the wonderful places yeah, to keep you on fire. But the most powerful place for your success will, of course, be in the very home in which you reside. And that's where you need to create the model of success for you. So once you've developed this plan, the next step is to track your actions. So if you are a business owner and you say we're going to put into effect a whole new thing where the workers will come in at 7 and they'll leave at 5 and da 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 what do you do? You track if they're coming in at 7 and having their lunch breaks at 12 to 1 and leaving it, you know, and then you look at productivity and you look at outcomes, right? So you want to track, did you really do what you said you were going to do or not? There are all kinds of fun gizmos. This aren't there. Everything from Fitbits on your wrist to see how much you move or my thing is how about Tom put it with your feet or handwriting stuff on a sheet of paper. You need to have that oversight for yourself if you're serious about achieving your best health. And you can do it. You can do it. Now, the next one, of course, is evaluating your success. What will success look like for you? Is it objective findings? Is it a waist circumference loss? Is it your blood pressure has come down? Is it subjective? Meaning you feel better in your skin? That you just feel like your skin's a little smoother? Is it that you have more energy? What is it that will make you go, I am successful? What we never want to do is the following. Set out an expectation that we do not do the right work to achieve and then be disappointed we didn't achieve the goal. You know what I'm saying? 
So the person who says, for example, I want to run the marathon, and every day they sit on the couch and watch television. <laughs> and they've signed up for the marathon. And the marathon come, day comes around, how are they going to feel? Depressed, sad, like a failure. Did they even, did they really fail though? Yeah. No, because they never even tried, they never did anything. So the same for you. So if you say, my goal is weight loss, and then you fail to track what you're eating, how you're exercising, etc., and then all of a sudden you're six months and you go, wow, I haven't lost any weight. This is frustrating. This doesn't work. Well, do you even know what you did? Right? I don't remember what I ate five days ago. Right? So if you don't write it down, you can't judge whether you're successful or not. The beauty of the inpatient model that we're hearing about in different places all over the country that many of the providers here are doing is what? There's accountability. And there's somebody giving you through the, like the true north. They come up to a little prison latch and they lift the thing up and they slide the food in there and they shut it. Where's Alex? In there? Oh my God, it's not food. It's a cup of water. So, right? So, you know, we, we always love joking about something like that, right? But that, so when you think about this, right, that's at the heart of this is accountability. You can have an accountability partner. You can do it on your own and write it out. You can do whatever works. But you've got to make sure you're being real about this. Right? Being real about this. What does success look like for you? And then evaluate that success as you go. And modify accordingly. So as you're going through this next 12 months, 24 months, etc., and you've got your life plan, your healthy living plan, you're going to track. You're going to look at success. You're going to like, it's so much fun though. It really does become fun. And once you've achieved some of these goals, you go, wonderful, I don't need to track anymore. I'm where I wanted to be. So now you just keep that health promoting program going long, and maybe once every six months, you pull out your health plan that you've written out tonight or tomorrow night, and you say, all right, so here is the nutrition goal, I achieved that. Here is the uh, you know, exercise goal, I've achieved that. Or wow, I, I'm not doing that as much anymore, so let's add a little bit of movement back into my life. You know, as we age, less than 15% of the population of the age of 65 gets the recommended amount of exercise. And that's a real problem, because even as we eat a full plant-based program, we end up with what's called sarcopenia, which is age-related muscle loss. And sarcopenia is clearly related to disability, dysfunction, fall risks, fracture risks, and mortality. So we don't want that. And the only way to prevent that, of course, is through exercise. Yeah? So exercise truly is the medicine that we should be giving ourselves every day. So modify what you're doing accordingly. And now the next one I said, which is equally important, is celebrate often and share the message of health with enthusiasm and enjoy. Because what did we say the whole goal of all this was? It's to create a foundation of health on which you can celebrate life and fulfill your human potential on earth. Right? That is what this is all about. The goal is not to achieve the top of the mountain and go, look at me with my amazing organic mangoes. That's not it. That's not it at all. Right? That's fun. I love mangoes, by the way. Um, but really what this is about is achieving that foundation of health so you can then take it, your life, to thriving. So pitfalls exist. They're real. And you can avoid them with conscious awareness. So be aware of the ones I spoke of and also identify in your own personal life and social circles others that you know and have seen. A pragmatic approach to your health increases the likelihood of success. So right now, I'm going to just close your eyes for a minute. And I'd like you to visualize yourself later this evening, or tomorrow, writing out your health plan. Believe that you can do it. And you can be successful in it. Or you can text on your cell phone right now, either way. So, open up your eyes again. So very important, right, that you are thinking in your head, and now beginning to put into practice and action this. So I won't be here tomorrow, but I think it'd be awesome if you brought your health plan to one of the doctors who are floating around. I'm going to ask them later how many people. Dr. Lim said he'd be happy to look hold your health them accountable. Yeah. So if you want to bring him, so I'm going to ask him, you know, you've got to know each other's cells. I'm going to text him and ask him how many people came to him tomorrow with their health plan. If I hear two or three, I'll be here this morning. Right? At least 40 or 50 would be great. But this is serious. Because we care about you. That's why we're here. So we're volunteering our time to be here to share this message with you. Okay? And our passion for this. I'd like to close because I know you're all hungry and so am I. 
Yeah. I'd like to close another quote from my grandfather. This is such a great thing, it should spread like wildfire. It offers great hope for people in a wide variety of conditions who respond well. But it requires discipline. It is not something to be bought or to be sold as a quick fix. Those who are not disciplined are accustomed to their addictions, and it's very difficult for them to get away from that. I tell people to value health and the pleasure of being well. Cherish the wonderful knowledge and the enjoyment that you gain from living in a healthy way. That is the reward of it all. And so true. And I wish you all a vibrant rest of the weekend. Thank you. Thank you.